For a, prog for a program that had 1,400 when I started. Yeah. And then we build on the satellites and the annex and all the rest of it. Probably got close to 200,000. See where BCTV News is now. Okay, from Nielsen. Mrs. Zanetti, why do you serve Mr. Zanetti Nabisco shredded wheat cereal? Because he's already sweet enough. Mrs. Blakely, why do you serve your family shredded wheat? Because you're already sweet enough. <laughs> The unsweetened cereal, Nabisco shredded wheat. All the goodness and natural taste of 100% whole wheat. Mr. Paulson, why does your wife serve you shredded wheat? Because I'm already sweet enough. <laughs> Aren't I lovely? <laughs> BCTV! Good morning. It's not much if you say it quickly, but the net losses of Brick, our company, or it used to be our company, uh, in the third quarter were something like $14.9 million. The good news is that Brick, for some mysterious reason, the shares went up 50 cents yesterday. But I've asked Jean Cormier, the senior corporate vice president of dear old lovable Brick, to come along this morning and try and explain to me the, the complications, because it looks like we're holding a $10 million bag in the Kaiser deal. Jean will tell me, I'm sure, what he can do in the best corporate interests of our, of our company. I keep saying it's our company. It's not really our company. And then, to add laughter, joy, and merriment to today's program, we're going to talk about the poor old bus drivers who are the next target. It was the teachers who got the hammer, right? And the BCGEU got a bit of a hammer, too. But I've got Colin Kelly and Jerry Krantz of Locals 1 and 2 of the Transit Union to tell us their fears because it looks to them like uh, the big boys above them in MTOC, BTC, GVRD, all the rest of these complicated structures are laying down the law that they'd better take a roll back, roll over and play dead or there won't be no more jobs somehow. We'll get down to that later. The other day I had a happy little moment when a caller stumped one of the great brains of the nation, a fellow by the name of Fairweather, uh, chairman of the Canadian Human Rights Commission. And Fairweather was asked a perfectly simple question, and this was the question. Is it correct that, uh, that uh, it is illegal for an employer to request your date of birth or age on an application for employment? Uh, look, you've caught me with my facts down. I, uh, well, let's say in, 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 fe in the Federal Civil Service, then. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, on the face of it, think that's a legitimate question. Uh, as long as the age doesn't uh, uh, inhibit the employing process in any way. Well, of course I mean, it they does. may need it for statistical reasons. No. But not for reasons of uh, saying yes or no to, to a job. I found out the facts and employed the entire resources of the Canadian Human Rights Commission with its multi-million dollar budget in Ottawa and its reams of regulations. And I'll give you the answer to the question, courtesy Mr. Fairweather's staff, later in the program. But first, Jean Cormier and Brick, after the break. <laughs> A couple of years ago, I think it was about October 1980, great fuss and foo for all when Brick bought the assets of Kaiser Resources Limited, and we paid, what, $700 million? Almost, yes. And that included, as I recall, <coughs> all the assets of Kaiser Resources. Um, all the assets except some. Um, there were things like a, a jet and so Yeah, on. I remember so we bought a couple of yeah. jets, a one jet, and we bought some lots in Acapulco and a couple of funny suites in New York. So they were paid for in cash. And a Cadillac yeah. auto in Japan yeah. and yes. a dozen other cars in Vancouver. Yes. Now, who bought that stuff back from us? 
Kaiser Resources bought that back from Brick and paid cash for it. Now at that time, uh, Henry had a very nice sweet deal whereby he was going to act as Brick's agent for the sale of coals on the forward contract in Japan. Yes, that's right. Now, now we, we talked about the cars and the automobiles and the jets and so on, and that was paid for in cash. Now there was another asset that was purchased by Kaiser Resources from BC Resources, which was not paid for in cash, and that was the oil and gas assets of, of uh, Kaiser Resources. That was Kaiser Oil. That's right. So That's you right. made a deal in brick to sell this to Kaiser for $18.5 million. Well, actually, it was $23 million. $4 million was paid in cash, and then a note for $18 million was accepted at an 11% interest rate to be paid over a period of several years. And uh, then you canceled the selling contract. Well, what happened also, at the same time as, the, as that particular sale was made, there was a selling contract for coal that would provide Kaiser Resources basically with 3.5% uh, of the revenues of the coal division or coal company. And that would bring him or bring the company somewhere between, say, 15 and $20 million a year. But then all of a sudden, so he, he's got to make you a payment, some immense payments. It was a million four. A million five each quarter? Yes, that's right. And yeah. you got a number of the payments, right? Oh, yes. Yes, that's right. And then all yeah. of a sudden you call a note. Well, all of a sudden the payment didn't arrive. Uh, on the 14th of October, a payment was due. Uh, up until then, the 18 million had been brought down to 10 million seven. Right. And so on, on the 14th of October, a payment was due, and it was not forthcoming. We did not receive the payment. Uh, at the same time, Kaiser Resources communicated with us and asked for a deferral of that particular payment. Uh, we denied that particular deferral and uh, then proceeded to ask for financial information about the company, which we received. Uh, upon study of that financial information and upon legal and financial advice, we concluded that it was in the best interest of our shareholders that if we were going to obtain any of the money that was owed to us, we had to file for a petition for bankruptcy, which is that what we did. To put Kaiser Resources Canada, the operation in Canada, into bankruptcy. Which uh, you've done? Filed for bankruptcy. Filed which for is, bankruptcy. Which is, which is uh, before the courts today, as a matter of fact. Oh, yeah. it's in front of the courts right now. Today, yes. But your intention is to recover as much as you can of the $10.7 million still owing to you. Exactly. Can I ask you now a very blunt question? Was that not a bad deal? In other words, you didn't have a personal note, and there are no real assets that you can yeah. seize in this country, are there? Well, you know, it's relatively easy to, to sort of look back on other people's deeds in the past and then pass judgment. But if you look at the context of the time, uh, you're looking here at a friendly takeover. Uh, you're looking at some a debt. Some people said it was too friendly. <laughs> well, perhaps. But you're looking here at a debt of some, say, $18 million, payments of basically a million for every quarter. Uh, but at the time, don't forget, there was a marketing contract that paid Kaiser Resources well in excess of that amount. So the people who made the deal could have easily said to themselves in good faith, look, if, if he doesn't pay, we'll cut off uh, his money from the coal contract. So therefore, the, I'm sure they felt quite secure at the time. Yeah, well, that money from the coal contract was cut off not long after the deal was made, as I recall, briefly. Well, it was cut off in the end of the first quarter of this year. So now you're into, oh, but are you first in line to get any money that's available in Kaiser or is not the Bank of Montreal ahead of you for $20 million? Yes, that's correct. Yes. <sighs> They're ahead yes. of you. Yes. There are some assets, though, that are the shares of Kaiser Oil, are there not? There are some assets. Uh, the company, uh, according to the affidavit that we're submitting before the courts today, uh, has debts of some $55 million, roughly $44 million owed to uh, the Bank of Montreal and uh, about $10.7 million owed to us and some $300,000 owed to, to others. Total debts of what? 55? About $55 million. 55 and assets of? Well, uh, we don't know exactly what the assets are, but clearly we suspect that they're somewhat less than 55 That's million. why you're yeah. filing the petition to put the company into bankruptcy so the assets can be divided up in the proper legal order. That's correct, yes. That's not very good news for us, is it, that? Well, we should try to put things into proportion. Uh, Ten million, we're talking about a debt of $10 I mean, million. You haven't been outfoxed huh? in this. Or have you been outfoxed no, oh, in I, this? No, absolutely not. I don't think so. Let's, let's put things in proportion, Jack. Now, you're, you're talking about a debt of $10 million against assets of $2,000 million. Or, if you want to put it in terms that people can understand, if that $2,000 million was $100, then that $10 million would be 50 cents. Uh, or, uh, since this is a coal company debt, BC Resources is responsible for two-thirds of it. So you're really talking about 35 cents against $100. So while we, we absolutely want to collect that money, 
it's not going to break the company. So let's, let's put things in, in proper proportion. I mean, it's an important amount. Yeah. But relatively speaking, it's not as much as you might think. Well, it's just like the, the federal liberals saying, more or less, as they did the other day when they reshuffled the budget, what's a billion dollars? Well, on a 24.5 yeah. or 26.4 billion dollar deficit. The trouble is that our economy now doesn't stand the juggling of these big figures because things are bad with BRIC now, are they not? Well, they're certainly not as good as we'd like them to well, be. Well, I just picked uh, up a clipping from the paper yeah. this morning. And sometimes I believe clippings mm -hmm. and sometimes I don't. Mm -hmm. The BC Timber lost $60 million in the first nine months. That's one of your jewels in your crown. No, it's not one of the jewels. It's one of the things that we own, and it is indeed a significant problem these days. Everybody in British Columbia knows what kind of trouble the forest industry is in. And uh, our losses for the corporation itself, and you mentioned $14 million right. uh, earlier, uh, are relatively small compared to other companies because we can balance it out against our our uh, Have revenues you got on anything the coal that's side. making money apart well, from cash in the bank? Oh, Kaiser is making money, and uh, you mean the coal from uh, Robert's Bank is making money? Oh, sure. Yes, it's not making as much as we'd like to, but it is making some. And uh, also, we expect that uh, the uh, Big Heart Oil and Gas Company, which we just purchased, the uh, which one? Big Heart Oil and Gas. Much to that. <coughs> I keep saying us. Am I entitled to say us? Is this company still largely held by the little people with their five free shares? There's a slightly smaller number than there was, but there's still 126,000 registered shareholders. And let's keep in mind that there's still a million and a half people who have five free shares out there. So yes, you certainly are entitled to say we. More questions from me and you, if you want to, to Jean Cormier, Cormier's secret. You used to be a television announcer. <laughs> oh, many years ago. Where? Oh, in Carleton, Quebec, on the Gaspé Peninsula, as a matter of fact. What year would that be? 1960. Yeah. And did you operate bilingually specifically? Yes, I did, as a matter of fact, because that was one of the rare things in Canada. There, are the, there is the occasional bilingual station, so I used to do French news and English sports, which is rather fun. Yeah. Webster and Jean Cormier, after the break. We had an initial promise, as I recall, from Premier Bennett that this would always be a BC-owned and controlled company, right? But only those with a block of 100 shares or more can become registered voters, right? That, that's correct, yes. Was there not recently a legal change which allowed you to go far and wide and flog any shares or raise preferred shares anywhere? No, 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 no. Uh, basically, the, the, the restriction is Canadian ownership, and that still applies. But uh, not BC. That's correct. But it's never been restricted only to British Columbia. It's always been restricted to Canadians, which it still is. But what's this preferred share issue you had recently? And why did you go for preferred shares, which are in better shape than my couple of hundred shares? Well, we, we, we bought a company called Big Heart Oil and Gas for $76 million. It's an excellent company in uh, operating essentially in Saskatchewan. Uh, we're going to change its name, incidentally, to West Star Petroleum. Uh, but basically the point is that in order to raise the cash to pay for that company, we issued a preferred share. Now, you may recall that we owned something like 9% of West Coast Transmission. Right. Instead of trying to sell West Coast Transmission in a block, in order to raise the money for the purchase of the oil assets, we floated a preferred share issue, which pays the, the person who, who owns it something like uh, 10 and 3 quarters percent interest. And then they are convertible into common shares of West Coast Transmission so that you, you, you buy the share, you get the interest, uh, almost 11%, and then when, when the shares of, of uh, West Coast Petroleum, or West Coast Transmission, rather, become worth $17, you can transfer them into, into those shares. So it's a good deal. But is now the time to be buying oil wells in Canada with the state of our national energy policy, the depression in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and British Columbia? Oh, yeah, it certainly is, particularly if you're buying in, in Saskatchewan. Because with the new government in Saskatchewan, there's been a freeze on uh, royalties for 18 months. And because we are pumping new oil, we get the new oil price. So you're looking at no royalties for 18 months in Saskatchewan, plus a really good price for the oil, something close to $45 a barrel. So well, it's really a good deal. You're not telling me it's the big hot oil and gas that's put our sh the brick shares up 50 cents. Oh, I think... Is know, that just a reflection of the Dow Jones syndrome in New York? That's my suspicion. You know, it's very hard to tell why shares go up and down, as you know. Yeah, well, it's not so difficult to tell why they're going down these yeah. days when every lumber company in British Columbia is losing 
millions every quarter, is it? Yes, it's, it's a very difficult time. Are you as depressed about the economic outlook as anybody else? Well, I'm not... I mean, give me the truth, Joe. Well, I'm not happy about it, but, but it's funny. We all go through stages, and I think I've sort of gone through my depression six months ago, and now I'm looking for uh, evidence that we have bottomed out, and I think we have. As far as our own company is concerned, I look to 1983 with some degree of optimism, because I think that Big Heart Oil and Gas is going to be an impressive and very good asset for the company. On July 1st, we start pumping oil from uh, the Brave Field in the North Sea. And uh, 12,000 barrels a day will, will belong to us. And uh, we're, we're very pleased with that. But that was another massive investment of yours. It certainly How much? was. Well, uh, we just finished the refinancing the other day, and the total package was 375 million Canadian dollars. And you're going to get 12,000 barrels of gas a day. Oil. 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 You bet. You bet. Yeah. Out of that, yeah. which goes into the British system. Yes, that's right. And you get your share of the revenue. Yes. Well, actually, we have the right to market the... Uh, the oil, so we can go into whatever system we Might want. Might take a call if there are any calls for Jean Cormier and Brick. Lots of room for them. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Morning. I'm Good very, morning. very unhappy with, uh, first of all, the buying of Kaiser Coal, and secondly, to think that you would have that big an expenditure by Mr. Kaiser and have an unsecured loan, which I, as a voting shareholder, don't have the privilege of getting at my bank. I have to either have the cash assets to back up what I want, or I have to have a mortgage on my home. On a personal guarantee. On a personal guarantee. I find a way in my life to get it. Do you... Another thing that bothers me is that uh, the way you have it now, any big company uh, could buy out a brick and we'd all be left sitting here not owning our own BC. I'm really upset with you. And I think you're the guy that got the expensive house in Shaughnessy to live in. So I'm unhappy with the whole thing. And I wish Mr. Bennett would take his brick and sink it. All right. Well, I That's don't a good friendly call. Three questions. Yes, Do yes. you have a personal guarantee from Edgar Kaiser? Well, no. I explained that earlier. That uh, oh. you know, it, it's rather difficult to to pass judgment on people who made deals in the past. But I did explain, as you may yes. recall, Jack, about the the business of feeling secure as a result of the coal marketing contract. Uh, the other uh, the other question related to uh, to what? Do you remember? Um. Uh, the big company could buy out oh, yes. uh, brick. Oh, yes. yes. Well, Anybody could move in and buy out brick and take control and take away those assets which formerly belonged after the NDP's action to the people of BC. Yes, nobody can buy out anything unless somebody wants to sell it. And another thing, I want to know if you're the one living in the expensive house in Shaughnessy. Yes, I am. Well, I resent that, too. We having to tighten our belt and pay through the nose for our mortgages, and that really makes me mad. Well, why should you be mad? I'm paying $2,000 a month rent. How much are you paying? I'm paying more than you, and, and uh, I'm looking after a daughter on top of it, so don't talk to me like that. Oh. $2,000 a month rent. Are you going to ask, in view of the reduction in the value of the house, that the rent be reduced? <laughs> no. <laughs> 2000 but uh, the economic yeah. rent would yeah. really be three or four, as I recall. Not necessarily. Anyway, we... But that was a yeah. deal you made in the East. You know? Oh, that you was... You came East because, one, you got this house, and two, because the rent was 2000 a month. That's right. Yeah, that's the Who deal. Who owns the house? BC Resources. Was it 600000 yeah. That's what it was. That's yeah. what it was, and it's yeah. not you worth probably, that much anymore. You couldn't sell it for three hundred today, could you? I don't know. I'm, we're, so, not, we're not trying to sell but it. But really, you've been down in the eye. Yeah. You're not paying 2000 a month on the house, yeah. which is only worth maybe 300000 that's, that's the deal that I made, and I that's live the up to the deals that I made. Ma'am, good calls. And Thank you. She wants you to sink brick. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. I was just wondering, um, when the prices of brick went down, was it because so many people sold their brick? Uh, it's, yes, it's possible. You see, in, in, in any kind of free market, it's clear that in order for, for prices to change, somebody has to want to buy at a certain price, and somebody else has, has to be willing to sell at that very price. So I suppose, you know, it's a question of how much confidence uh, people have in the future of their investment. And if they decide that it, they don't have much confidence in the future, then they're willing to sell at a lower price and take their losses. So, in, in a sense, uh, I think you, your question is, is a good Just one. Just back to the other question. Well, okay, I, I sold mine at $6. Well, I'm, I'm pretty happy that I did that because otherwise, if I sold it now, it'd be two fifty or something, right? Three fifty. Uh, three ten yesterday. Three ten yesterday. Oh, it went up a bit, huh? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, bye. But just back to that other question: Is conceivably the company could be bought out 
from under the people of BC by somebody in the East. Conceivably, if they could get at the shares. Oh, yes. yes. There's no yes. statutory uh, limit of control for any group, is there? Well, there used to be. Uh, you may recall. There, yes. was, there was a maximum of 1% for individuals and 3% for institutions. But that restriction was removed. So there are now no restrictions. It's On indeed, the ownership of but, but the ownership has to be Canadian. That's, yeah. Go ahead, please, from Victoria. Yeah, hello. When I bought big shares, I was under the impression that uh, it will create some new industries or jobs in BC. But so far, all I've seen of BRIC is that they uh, made bad investments and, and, and their value went down. Will they ever get down to creating new jobs, secondary industries, or, or doing something innovative in BC? That's my question to you, I guess. Yes, uh, certainly. There, there's, there's a mine going in uh, production uh, early next year called Green Hills, which is in uh, southeastern British Columbia. It's a brand new mine. It's creating something like 600 permanent jobs and many thousands of jobs in the construction process. Gold so, or silver? Uh, no, no, no. It's coal. It's oh, coal. It's coal, coal, mine. coal, yes. coal, yes. coal. Green Hills. And so yeah. there's an example of job creation by, by the investment. What about the there. expansion of Roberts Bank? Or as uh, the competition with Northeast Coal make Canavis? No, no, no. Uh, northeast uh, or Tumble Ridge. West Shore, West Shore Terminals is being doubled in size, and I forgot to mention that because right. that creates new jobs as well. But uh, does it make us nervous? Not particularly. We uh, business is not good for the coal business relative to what it used to be, uh, but we have contracts and uh, we expect people to honor those contracts, and we expect business to be reasonable. These are contracts where the quantities of coal must be purchased. No, these are, we're talking about West Shore Terminals now. We're talking about the contracts with the various people that ship through that particular facility. And uh, they undertake to, to ship through that facility. That's the kind of contract I'm How come West Shore Terminals is not involved in this foul up in the Vancouver Waterfront? Well, basically for two reasons. The company is not part of the Maritime Employers Association. That's smart. Uh, <laughs> plus the fact that the, uh, the union members are... Are, are part of the union but have a separate contract and so it's a separate contract which was signed and agreed to oh, last summer I think it was. So the ILWU and the West Shore Terminals are living happily in peace and amity and there's no stoppage of shipping down there. That's correct. Okie dokie. Uh, one's not supposed to express wishes but best of luck in getting your 10.7 million back from Henry whom I believe is in Vancouver at this moment. I believe so. Henry wants to come on and tell me about the deal, but delighted to have you on, Henry. Never had a Kaiser on the air, not even old German Bill. Far less a real legitimate local Canadian Kaiser. My thanks to Jean Carmier. Next, uh, besides I'm too young to have a Kaiser Bill on the air. Next, I'm going to talk to the boys from the buses after the break. <laughs> I'm keeping a smile on my face regardless nowadays, you know, and you can almost pick out the services that are going to come to a crunch unless a miracle happens, Reagan wins the battle, the American economy goes crazy and housing starts, because right up to now we thought that everything had to go up the way. And then came the hammer, first of all in the BCGEU, although they escaped from under the hammer largely, and then came the teachers. Now it's the bus drivers, and I must say I have some sympathy with the bus drivers this morning because it looks like a programmed attack. Now we all know that revenues are down, and most of us know that the loss on the bus service last year was a hundred million dollars in cash. But now we have a new situation whereby doomsday is being talked about, doomsday cuts in service, you know. And there are so many authorities involved, the only people I know for sure who are in the transit service are these two guys here and their members. Colin Kelly, who represents bus drivers and local one of the independent transit union, right? Canadian transit. Canadian transit unit, union. And Jerry Kant, so local number two, who represents the sea bus people and the maintenance workers. Now, we know they work in the buses. Above that, we've got BTOC, MTOC, GVRD, SC Vic, which is Social Credit Victoria, Willie Van Der Zijn and all the rest of them, and I don't quite know who runs the buses, but I think it's the Metro Transit Operating Company. Is that correct? That's what they tell us. They're the people who deal with you. 
Yes. All right. What are the threats uh, that you have received in your most recent communication from Bill Reid on the subject of what's going to happen to the jobs next year? You gave me a letter and I've lost okay. it. Okay. What, uh, what Bill Reid has said is there's going to be cutbacks, layoffs, uh, regardless of uh, any negotiations with the union. And uh, to date, uh, we haven't had any meetings with the company, not that we haven't tried, but uh, to discuss this whole issue. They say there's no information for us and uh, there's nothing to talk about. Now, uh, when is your contract up? March 31st, 83. March 31st, 83. Do you think they're trying to soften you up for the contract or are they, are they facing a real economic money crisis? Well, if we look at the history, that's uh, when they brought the uh, cuts in on uh, health and the HEU suffered. And then uh, just prior to the teachers negotiating, they brought in their budget cuts. Uh, now they're bringing in our budget cuts just prior to us going into negotiations. What are we supposed to think? This is a letter from Bill Reed, chairman of the MTOC, the Men's Metro Transit Operating Company, to Bill Allen. Do you believe when he tells Allen that the preliminary estimate for the transit system as is for a deficit 83-84 is 139 million? Could very well be, I have no idea. And that they're going to be, the amount available for the transit system during that year will be 115 million. Yes, well the impact here is about a 17 percent reduction in funding, which can relate to a 17 percent reduction in the service. Now that means that uh, a bus system, the transit system, which is now running at peak capacity, we have buses at uh, peak hours that are loaded to the doors, that are going by bus stops and leaving people standing. Now, if we make a 17% cut in that service, we're going to have chaos. Too many people now, or not too many, but I suppose a lot of people are dependent on the transit system. And if they cut the service by 17%, I envision full buses all day long with probably hundreds of people stranded at bus stops trying to get to and from work or to shopping or wherever. Are you telling me that this is an efficient operation, this MTOC? Or could it not be possible that there are many empty buses running at many times which could be cut? No, I don't think that there are uh, uh, buses that, uh, that should be cut. Could be cut. Well, uh, maybe there should be. There are some that could be cut, but uh, to serve what purpose? I mean, uh, the the society says that we want a transit system. We want a sewer system. I suppose that there's some sewers that aren't used very often. Does that mean that you you uh, take them out of service? No, I think we've always recognized that the bus service has had to be uh, subsidized. In fact, it, until recently, a few years back, it was subsidized by really the charges on our light light bills. Was mm -hmm. it not? Mm -hmm. And now it's in an economic position. But when Alan got this letter, Bill Allen, general manager from Reed, were you given this officially? Well, we were given it to, uh, given it uh, by some officials of MTOC. Neither Bill Allen nor Bill Reed was present at this uh, meeting, and uh, we thought that was very, uh, very bad form. But the whole uh, presentation has been bad form. We've had the deal with the company on this issue through the media. This has been our source of, uh, of information. They've been phoning into the media, uh, giving press releases, and that's how we pick it up. We want to deal with the company on this. We want to discuss the whole issue, but they're unwilling to meet and discuss this. I mean, you're not stupid about it. You realize there could be a problem, right? Oh, very well. We, uh, we expect that there is a problem. They've presented us with the fact that there is a problem. And what they're saying in that letter is it's not, it's not our pro their problem, it's our problem. They're trying to pass it off as being our problem. They haven't presented a proposal on how to deal with that oh, problem. Oh, yes, they yet. have. Hey, Alan is directed here by Reed. You are also directed to enter into negotiations with the bargaining units on wage and salary rollbacks, freezes to the reduced layoffs, and maintain service as much as is possible. Uh, obviously, they're talking about rollback, work sharing agreements for the future. Does that make you happy? Well, uh, there again, it's a letter to, uh, from Bill Reed to Bill Allen, and uh, we were invited down to read his mail. Uh, why don't they present something to us? You'd think they'd call you in and say we've got a problem, wouldn't you? Well, I think they would. Bill Reed's come up with a solution and uh, as far as cutting back the service. And what he says is that they should stop uh, running the buses on Sundays and after 9 o'clock. Now, this city has a lot of people who have jobs that uh, are shift work related. And uh, because of the present economic climate, 
uh, personal transportation has become a luxury and they're dependent upon public transit. Now, if an afternoon worker gets to work and the buses are cut off after nine, how does he get home? And conversely, how does a, a person who's on night shift even get to work? What are these people supposed to do? Are they supposed to take cabs from uh, Surrey into downtown? Or are they supposed to walk or hitch rides? Well, it doesn't make sense that you'd cut out all buses on Sundays around well, 9 p.m., does it? Yeah, well, that's what he stated. Isn't it peculiar that they, uh, they recently had a seminar in uh, Victoria on transit alternatives? And one of the things that came up was that uh, the uh, government would cease their bus operations in the evening and then let private transportation take over. You're joking. No, I'm not. Oh, I don't know. Mind you, we, the, on the next thing we're going to disagree. I'm... Well, I don't know. What are we going to talk about, Jack? Well, I'm presuming I was a happy rider of the old Interurban. Best transit service we ever had mm. when I was a boy. And it was a great transit service. It was a great transit service. An ALRT, Canadian built, Canadian invention, on stilts. Looks great to me, and you both hate it. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't uh, oppose uh, a light rail uh, transit system, not at all. But what we say is they should put in a conventional system, something that's proven. ALRT is brand new technology. It's uh, extremely expensive. They've got a billion dollar budget for it. And uh, we don't believe it's going to be efficient. It's only going to carry, uh, by uh, their own estimation, somewhere between 14 and 18 percent of the ridership. Mm -hmm. Now, if they put in a conventional light rapid transit system, which is still on rails, we agree that we need something like this, they can save a minimum of $350 million. But they've already spent 50. Well, yes, but I million. mean, yes, but that's a small drop in the bucket compared to the billion dollars that they may spend. Now, not only will they have $350 million freed up, but they can use this money then in other areas where they've had service cutbacks. Maybe there doesn't have to be the same kind of cutbacks in education, health, or legal aid that now exists. The construction looked good, you know. The, the ALRT, ALRT is a totally negative project. It doesn't have any real redeeming features to it. Even some of that $350 million could go into job creation. And uh, maybe that... You're shattering my illusions. I well, thought it was new and modern. Well, one. look, Jack, how can, it, how can the government preach to, its, uh, to the people that work in, in the different uh, uh, crown corporations and say restraint and cut back there and cut back there? I want those employees to cut back. Yet forge ahead with a, a, a monument like ALRT when we could have a, a system, a transit system on light rail transit. Do you, you've lost that fight? No way. No. Well, you even have if to it, throw even, the government out. Even if we have to take a hundred million dollar loss, we'd be better off to take that loss and eat it and, and go to conventional transit. Good. Well said anyway. You're still the best paid and best no, bus we're not. drivers no, in North we're not. America. Not, no, not anywhere near Canada. it. Canada. Not anywhere near it. Montreal and Hamilton for two are way ahead of us. Uh, we're going to have Bill Reed on the phone briefly just to cover a couple of basic points, I think, and, see, and ask him why he didn't consult you properly instead of dealing through the media with you. We'd like to know that too, Okay, Jack. we'll ask him straight up after the break. Bill Reed is chairman of the board of the Metro of MTOC. Bill, why didn't you have the decency and the courtesy to bring these guys into your initial plans when you sent the memo to Bill Allen? Well, Jack, it's, it's not the place of the board of directors to meet with the uh, union representatives. What, what I, had it, I had instituted was some meetings with our senior staff to discuss the, pro the potential problems that were going to be faced in 83 with the union executive in advance. And uh, that, uh, unfortunately, uh, it appears that the information which was transmitted to Colin and, and to uh, yeah, Jerry was not accepted in the light in which it was presented. They're looking for, I guess, an official letter from the chairman of the board, which if they don't accept the one which I gave to Bill Allen as, as uh, some instruction as to where we're heading, I'm prepared to give them a letter direct. And the other thing I wanted to cover is they, uh, Jerry said that uh, the company and the management and I am not prepared to meet with them. We met with them yesterday at 4 o'clock at, uh, at our TAC office downtown Vancouver. I don't know uh, how much further we can go in meeting with them. Did, did, 
Jack. Okay, that meeting that, uh, that we held yesterday afternoon at 4 o'clock did not uh, take into account this whole total picture of cutbacks and layoffs. And as you're well aware, that was a separate issue outside of this issue. Okay, I'm aware of that, but what we met with about yesterday was the start of, of trying to help in the reductions of employees. And yesterday was dealing with a, fine, with a minor portion of the problem. And uh, I guess it was supposed to start us on the way in trying to relieve some of the pressure that we're going to be faced in March. Colin? Well, why is it the, that we got a phone call uh, late yesterday morning from Bill Allen, the general manager of MTOC, and for the first time we heard the number 600 uh, people laid off, bandied around, and that followed up by the fact that uh, Bill Allen told us at that time there was no uh, planned meetings between the union and the company. Well, okay, the, let me ask you a question. We'll leave that for the moment. When did you plan to start your layoffs? Well, we're starting on the, some uh, minor layoffs right away, Jack. How many? Well, we were talking yesterday, and the number is uh, four to six. Are these bus drivers or administrative staff? Oh, they're part of the maintenance people. Are you considering cutting back the salaries of all the executives? Yes, we are. Have you decided to figure on their cutback? The same as the applies right across the board with the company. Are you telling me that? So what percentage is that? Well, we're, we're $24 million shortfall in 1983, Jack. That equates to a minus 17% figure. So I guess minus 17% for everybody. Well, does that mean, uh, consider this, that you are planning a 17% cutback in the wages of administration now or for the new contract? Now. 17% cutback now. We're asking for rollbacks now. On, on non-union people? Yes. On union people, of course, you can't ask for that. All the rest, they have, all of our senior people have been frozen since the uh, implementation of the, of the uh, stabilization program. And you're asking all your non-union people to take a 17% cutback now? We're working on that. My God. Hey, for next year, though, that for the bus driver's money is all right for this year because you can't interfere with a contract. W let me ask the bus drivers, would you volunteer to roll back now? No, not, not if, none of, no not if they're gonna, not going to talk to us about it beforehand. But these, off the top, no way. These discussions should be left for contract negotiations. The company is acting clearly in bad faith. They're going to the media with some proposals that they plan on presenting at the contract uh, negotiations. Now, that starts in four weeks. Now, we don't want to deal through the media to discuss our problems with the company and vice versa. We don't think that they should. But you're very, you're very upset that you haven't been involved since day one on a detailed appreciation and information on all the problems. That's right, Jack. We're not the only ones. The GVRD, the GVRD pardon me, is, is left in the dark on this as well. They didn't know about these proposed cutbacks. Now, it seems to us that a public transit system should be run in the interest of the public. Oh, and they should have that. the input. Okay, what's happening here is, is we're having a few people making the decisions. And they're the ones who are deciding the cutbacks are necessary. Maybe the people of Vancouver and Victoria, the, the transit riders are affected. Maybe they don't feel the same way. Maybe they feel that their public transit system is a priority. And I believe that it is. Let me ask Bill Reed a question. Bill. Yes, Jack. Here we are now. We start with you, MTOC. You are the operating company for all of the transit in Metro. Yes, the C bus and all the buses. Right. Who is, where do you get your money from? You get 75% of the deficit from the provincial government and 25% from the GVRD, right? Yes, that's correct. And the balance comes from fares. Yes. I know. Now, this year's fares, Jack, are, six, are going to be $6 million short of, of the projected revenue. You mean the, the depression has cut your fair six million bucks? Yes. Now, next question though. Above you, what's the body above you? What's this BC Transit? They run all of the transit. For the whole province. They're the overall umbrella body. Yes. And then above them is the minister and the cabinet who feed them the money. That's right. That's Jack Davis. No, Jack Davis is which lot? No, Jack is with ALRT. Oh, he's with the baddies. How about the GVRD? Well, and then there's the GVRD, of course, which is part of the BTC. I'm sorry, Jack? Is the GVRD part of one of these organizations like MTOC? Well, yes. They're, they're the ones that set the, the program for scheduling and fares. 
And let me uh, make a point clear uh, on your program, if I may. Yes, please. I did not say that I intended or I, we don't have a control over the service. I, I suggested yesterday in the, the media report that if there were some ways to save money, some of them may be to reduce services on Sundays and reduce some late night services. I did not say cut out Sunday service, and I did not say cut out all the service. You mean reduce it? Reduce it. Because chance on the air, since you seem to be the mediator for the province, let me explain to the union at this point, uh, Colin, it seems to be unclear as to who his employer is. His employer is Metro Transit Operating Company. If he wasn't clear up until today, he is our employee. And I will meet with them as soon as they wish to discuss the whole problem once, uh, once I can get with them. How's that? Well, look, he said that yesterday. I asked him if he was prepared to put any proposals forward that we could talk about, and they don't have any. No, he wants to meet with you and tell you his problems and see how uh, you react. He's trying to make his problem our problem. Well, let me ask a critical... Did Van der Zam tell you that you had to cut 17%? Bill? No. Has he been involved in this, or are his fingers still clean for the moment? No, no, he hasn't been involved with discussions about the finances. Okay, Bill, I'll have to have, this is going to be a great crisis, I'll have to have you on the air soon, but uh, meanwhile, Colin will give you a call after the program and set a meeting up with you to discuss, maybe he's prepared to take a roll back, eh, hey, Colin? How about job sharing? Well, look, if, even if that's the case, even if we were to job share, it still means a 17% cut in the, in the amount of service that's on the road. No, now that's that, not correct. That's not correct, Jack. What is correct, then? Well, we're prepared to, uh, to negotiate with them or discuss with them how to job share without losing any employees and maintaining the service as, as it is. We're not talking about splitting in the day and a half. Uh, but we have so many problems with absenteeism and overtime and the rest of things that Colin's aware of that if we negotiate some of those out of our problem areas, we can certainly reduce the overall net deficit to the operation in the whole uh, I can already see the agenda. Absenteeism, overtime, fancy split shifts. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I tell you, we could volunteer to work for nothing and then uh, there would be no problems at all. I mean, just exactly what do they want? I, are they not prepared to pay a, an honest day's work? Are they, are they not convinced that we work a, a full day now? I don't know. Are you, Bill? Well, look, I'm not, I'm not for one moment suggesting that the drivers aren't earning their pay. What I'm suggesting is that there are some, some abuses of the absentee system, which is costing us around $8 million for the operation in, the, in a one fiscal year, and that is the largest probably uh, uh, absentee cost to any operation within Canada, I would say. <coughs> An $8 million abuse which would have covered your $6 million deficit and left you $2 million over. That would help. Yeah. What's this abuse, Colin? Tell me about this abuse that you're accused of. Hey, um, Jenny. Okay, we offered last February to take over the sick plan from the company if they would pay us $5 million a year. Now, that offer still holds. If the company is really sincere in cutting back on uh, their sick costs, uh, payments for sick plan, of uh, what they would, what would be, I guess, $3 million here, we'll take over the plan for $5 million and we'll do it right away. So there's no problem there. As far as the overtime, the high cost... You said you want to run the system. No, we want to run the sick plan. Do you, realize, do you concede that there is a racket in absenteeism? No, we don't concede that at all. But uh, what we're saying is, is that if, if uh, they're concerned about the high cost of the sick plan and they're banting the figure of $8 million around, why not save $3 million? Now, that, give us the plan for $5 million. We'll administer it. We'll look after it. And it's completely out of their ballpark then. Now, as far as the overtime goes, if they're concerned about uh, having to pay out a lot of extra wages for overtime, one can only assume and that perhaps there's too much work for the reduced staff that they have there now. If uh, that's the only reason, if you have enough people working, there's no need for overtime. But they have been cutting back on the people. They haven't hired anybody for a year. And attrition has been going, uh, taking care of uh, any kind of increases. We're down, I don't know how many people. And the people that are left are having to, uh, to work a little bit uh, longer. I've got to take a break. Bill, thank you very much. I'll have you on the air one of these mornings when it heats up after your meetings, right? Very pleased to, Jack. And you'll be having a meeting soon with Colin Kelly, and he'll present his views, and you'll present your views, and who knows, you might have some firm proposals, apart from the fact that you want to wipe out this $8 million racket. <coughs> Looking Just forward to it. Much obliged. Okay, Jack. Bye.
That was quite good fun. Hold your breath, hold your breath, hold your breath. After the break. Back on air. Well, anyway, that's very kind of you to offer to take over the MTOC sick plan. If they'll give you just a modest sum of $5 million in your hand, and you'll cut it down from the $8 million it cost last year and administer the sick plan for $5 million. We'll save them $3 million cold, hard cash. Maybe you should take over the whole system and wipe out, wipe out any political hacks you find along the way. We wouldn't want to say we could do a better job. You wouldn't want no, to say that? No, we wouldn't want to say that. Why not? Well, they have their jobs to do. Mm -hmm. We'd like to be included sometime, you know, uh, in, in helping them, but they, they don't ask us. Well, mind you, the last the dispute you had a couple of years ago, there was some real bad feeling. Remember all the bad feeling? Was that before your union came into the picture? Yes, um, we've, yes we've only been in since January the 18th of this year. So, um, so you threw out the other union. Mm -hmm. yes. What was it called again? The ATU. ATU. Mm -hmm. That was an AFL-CIO union. It's yes. an American-based union. Yeah. Yes. Now well, we're yeah, an honest to God, legitimate, independent Canadian union. Canadian. Are you part of KMO? No. We're part of CCU, the Confederation of Canadian Unions. That's KMO. KMO is involved in that. KMO yes. KMO is a member as, as uh, well as many other unions. Mm. Mm. Okay, mm. let's go to the phones. Mm. Anything else you want to say? No, I send you? Uh, I'm ready. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. That's um, your call. <clears throat> speaking with trans, speaking with transit uh, riders, they do not mind paying a higher fare to maintain the present service, and uh, that would solve the entire problem of the money shortage. And uh, also, aside from that, the one fact we must uh, reawaken to is the fact that we have a car dealership cabinet. I would like your comments on that, please. Which would you rather have, car dealership or social workers? I mean, I think you can sneer at car dealers and you can just as much sneer at social workers or anybody else in politics who has never really done a day's work in their life. Now, what about a fair increase? I don't think a fair increase is necessary. As far as I know... $100 million deficit. Just a minute. As far as I know, the government of B.C. is committed to supplying 66 and two-thirds percent of the transit budget, the transit deficit. Right. Now... I thought it was 75. How can they arbitrarily remove themselves from that agreement? Well, they can't, but if they cut down the overall cost with pressure, they can reduce the amount of the money they have to put they've, in. They've indicated that they're cutting their budget by $24 million, and what they're doing is abrogating their responsibility to the transit system. MTOC just went through a cutback about, uh, I don't know, a couple of months ago. And uh, at that time, it was around the $10 million figure. And van der Zam stated at that time that the cutback must be made without a reduction in service or without a fair increase. Now, it seems to have all changed. Uh, they still say that there can't be a fair increase, but they say that there, there obviously has to be a, a reduction in service. Are did they, they make that $10 million cutback? Yes, a they did. They made it. Yes. And now we're asked to, to or the company, it appears, is going through another $24 million cutback. Are they going to run this company right into the ground? Public transit is a service. So are public libraries and everything else. It must be subsidized. It will not run unless it's subsidized. Even if they wanted to go public after 9 o'clock or 6 o'clock at night, they would end up subsidizing that public employer. Can they go public after 9 o'clock? You mean taxis? Or private, rather. I mean private. Mm -hmm. well, you mean taxis? Sure. Nothing else. Small is buses, it? taxis. They're, they're, uh, the, a big operator in Victoria has already put forward that proposal. Oh, and I, I, think that the, I think that the government's probably looking at it. They're trying to get out of something that costs them money. They're trying to get out of their commitment the to transit. The fact of the matter is that the MTOC people are not in a position to make decisions at all about money. They're told cut. That's yes. right. Why do, they, why do they sit there and take it? Do they just say, okay, we've got a budget cut and we're going to have to take it to our employees? Why yes. don't they say, hey, we're not taking this budget cut? Yeah, at least the school trustees fought against That's right. the cuts, although they said in the final analysis that they would implement the cuts. We don't even know, Jack, if these cuts have actually been formalized yet. The only uh, information that we have is a letter from Bill Allen to Bill Reed, or from Bill Reed to Bill Allen, 
and it says on there, I have received informal notification. And uh, if that's the case, maybe this thing is just a pie in the sky. The whole thing is uh, just a scare tactic again. Well, I'm inclined to agree. It looks like panic in the streets. To cause mm -hmm. panic in the streets, give you a bad image, and do what they did to the teachers quite successfully. Mm -hmm. They're intimidating the public as well, though, because uh, the public can relate these cutbacks to a cutback in service. And the company is coming out and saying, listen, we know that you're using the public transit system now, but that's too bad, because we're going to take a big piece of, of, of it away from you. Yeah, I would, I would say right in the face of it, it's been too brutally done without any consultation or proper information. Informal notification. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I want to make a comment about, like, the, if you notice the new buses uh, are being painted uh, BC colors, and they're mm -hmm. costing approximately $9,000 each to paint, like, what about cutting 9, back and stuff like that? No, it wouldn't, back and it wouldn't be 9,000. Couldn't like be 9,000 to paint them. No. no, no. Anyway, they're painting them with... Are they putting that's the BC spirit on the buses? Yeah. Are they? They plan to put the, that logo on the front. I don't know if they're carrying through with that or not. That's a piece of political gall, isn't it? So is the color. There was, uh, there was no necessity to change the color. No, red, they were white, blue. they were orange and brown. Oh, are these are And no now colors. they're going to be red, white, and blue, and gray on the bottom. That's the BC spirit. That's the BC spirit. Vote social credit, mind Just you. Just like the BC ferries. Yeah. Mind you, it could lash back against them, couldn't it? First, there's no buses. <laughs> After the break. Do you want to break now, Fred? Do you want to break now? Seems a bit quick. <laughs> All right, take the break. When's that? Col Colin Kelly of the Transit Independent Canadian Transit Union. Correct. Right? And Jerry Krantz. How much do you lose in that magnificent sea bus a year? 35 million bucks? I don't know. It provides an excellent service. Um, right now, uh, the people in North Van City, the Alderman and uh, Council, is asking uh, to have that service expanded. There's a, a big development taking place right now at Lonsdale, Lonsdale Key. And that includes uh, housing. And uh, right now, the two C buses that are in operation are running at peak capacity at, uh, at are they rush all, hours. Are they all straight time shifts or any double time, uh, time and a half shifts? <sighs> no, they work a uh, system similar that's in the marine industry where they have oh, yeah. uh, banking of so uh, many hours. Years. That's so right. Many hours that's year. right. Anyway, it loses 35 million a year. Well, yes, but so does the, uh, the police force and the fire department. I don't think that's the issue. Oh, no, I only mentioned. <laughs> You're going to have a public meeting. Yes, uh, the ICTU is sponsoring a public meeting on uh, the uh, future of transit in, in the Greater Vancouver and Victoria area. And that's on the 14th of November at the Templeton High School Auditorium. Here? Here. 7.30. And it's at 7.30 seven at night. on the 14th. We've invited and uh, had ex um, acceptances from um, uh, Jack Davis, Mike Harcourt, uh, Harry Rankin, Bruce York, and Mae Brown. And uh, Bill Van Der Zandt. No, we haven't invited. Did we invite Bill Van Der Zandt or not? I forget if we did. Oh, well, if you want television coverage, you've got to invite Van Der Zandt and throw things at him. Mm. <laughs> we thought he took quite a beating with the teachers, so that uh, maybe he wasn't up to it. Oh, no, no, no. He's tough. Don't you kid yourself about Willie. He's tough. He couldn't care less what you say about Can't him. Can't insult that guy, can you? <laughs> no. God is on his side. Uh, next thing. What was I going to say? Phones. Well, ALRT, let's not talk about that anymore. Because we'll try a, not to. That's it's, a political decision. Well, let's, let's, let's put on some political heat then. I think you're down a tube on that one. How can you justify $40 million per kilometer when, uh, when you can do it for 15, especially in these economic times that we're suffering from now? How can they justify it? Do you think Bennett wants Bennett's folly sticking along Terminal Avenue at forty million dollars to point and scream at? Wouldn't it be a great Pride. Wouldn't it be a great item to jog the memory? Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. Is the true subsidized cost of a bus ride something over two dollars? Two seventy five. Two seventy five. Why is it that an independent private company in Washington DC can provide a comparable service at uh, I think seventy five cents a ride? Well, compare the wage rates. Can you compare the wage rates? 
Um, no, I, I would imagine that we make a little bit more than they do in Washington, but uh, I would like to know what the amount of the subsidy is in, in Washington. There will be a subsidy to that, too. Oh, sure you, of it. you no, better believe it. I was my understanding it. six years ago that there was no subsidy. Well, no, I think you're out of date. Uh, <laughs> besides wage rates in Washington State and many unorganized industries at about one-third of the rates in B.C. If there's no subsidy, it's being run by Robin Hood. <laughs> That's Robin Hood, yes. <laughs> That's a good line, though. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Yeah, I'll direct my question to Colin. Yes. Uh, do you think the Socreds are out to break up the unions? Oh, not the Socreds, uh, possibly so much as the, uh, the MTOC. Right. I think that they, uh, they've encountered a little more than they're used to, and uh, quite frankly, they don't know how to respond to us. Well, I'm a teacher, and uh, we've, we're going to lose about eight days pay this year, and there's still about uh, 2,000 who's going to be laid off. So uh, would nice. you guys be willing to join the teachers and get rid of the Socrates? I hope that we can uh, come up with some type of uh, coalition just like that. Uh, we both have a common enemy, I believe, in Bill Van Der Zam. Well, I don't think he's the enemy. He just doesn't know what he's doing. Well, he's out in Surrey, and uh, we're going to lose 300 jobs out there, and there's an increase of 2,000 students. Over the years, old chap, your students have been dropping off by the, hunt, by no, the no. thousands and thousands, and your costs have been going up, and you got 17.3% last year, and don't tell me the teachers getting five extra unpaid days off are being hard done to. Oh, no, I agree with that, Jack, completely. I think that I take 10 days off or 15 don't days off. Don't tell me teachers are hard done to. There are good teachers and there are bad teachers. Jack. They've got no sympathy in this province at the moment. Jack. Not like decent, honest bus drivers. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Good morning. Morning. Uh, Mr. Webster and uh, guests, I, I'm a transit user, and I feel that the Metro Transit is a good service, and it stands uh, the way it stands right now. But uh, I feel that the service uh, should be left as it is, and uh, I understand that the fares are going to be going up. Is but, it? A uh, they're going to be chopping the service all to... Well, that's what we're talking about this morning, yeah, the possibility. Yeah, they're going to chop it all up. Uh, but... Who said to cut the transit service? Uh, I'd like to know. That's and what the program's been all about. Yeah, well, just a minute. And uh, it's an important service. Uh, here, here. I go out at night, and if they cut it, there's no way for me to get back. Okay. Fair enough. Go ahead, Ripple. please. Go ahead, please. Hello, Jack. Yes. Yeah, listen. Uh, they're talking about cutting transit service. Now, I'm getting back to LRT again. No. Uh, now, just a minute, Jack. Listen no. to me out, will you, please? These buses are going to have to feed the LRT. You are a regular caller, I hear you, and every radio open line show in the country, and how come you phoned me this morning? I don't know, but go phone an open line show. I'll be back after the break. <laughs> I'm going to pay a compliment to my two guests from the Independent Canadian Transit Unit. Colin Kelly, local number one, and Jerry Krantz, local number two. You boys certainly are a different breed of cat from the people that, uh, of the old international type unions. When did you take over? January the 18th of this year, Jack. What kind of a vote did you have to break away from the old one? Uh, actually, the vote was very close. Uh, 16 votes separated the, uh, the two of us. And uh, I think it would have been greater if we had done it, uh, if we had the vote at the time we had signed up all of the people, but um, there was a long delay. Anyway, you're going to stay public, you're going to express your views. You don't seem to be that overtly political, except that you hate Van der Sam, which is understandable, I suppose. Uh, we're, but we're not, Yes, we're not affiliated to any political party. In fact, our constitution forbids it. Now, uh, so we you will can't give money to the NDP? No, we, uh, we can't do it as a union body. The members can do it individually if they wish. But uh, we will support good legislation and we will fight bad legislation. Okay, well, I trust that Bill Reid and Bill Allen and Jack Davis and all the rest of them include you in their detailed discussions if they have, as I suspect, a real economic panic and give you a chance to argue properly long before negotiations mm -hmm. start and protect, as I'm sure you will, your own interests and hopefully the interests of the public. I hope so too. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Stay Jack. there for just a moment. Now, I must explain. The other day I had Gordon Fairweather, the chairman of the Canadian Human Rights Commission, on the air. 
and he was stumped by a very simple question. It was really quite funny. I didn't, it was a caller who asked him the question. I want you to watch the question, then I'll give you the answer I have since found out. Is it correct that, uh, that uh, it is illegal for an employer to request your date of birth or age on an application for employment? Uh, look, you've caught me with my facts down. I, uh, well, let's say in, 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 in the Federal Civil Service, then. Yeah. I, uh, on the face of it, think that's a legitimate question. Uh, as long as the age doesn't uh, uh, inhibit the employing process in any way. Well, of course I mean, it they does. may need it for statistical reasons. No. But not for reasons of uh, saying yes or no to, to a job. Mr. Fairweather Staff in Ottawa this morning on my request supplied me with the answer. As far as federal applications for jobs of concern, including, you know, all the ones allied with the current way in one way and another, an employer cannot even put age on the application form. And the employer can only ask age if it's in direct relation to the job. To wit, are you old enough to drive a truck? To wit, are you over the age of 65 because we have an arrangement in this particular operation that you must contractually retire at 65. Age is a boo-boo, is a no-no on a federal application form or in interviewing the applicant for the job. Now, before I extrapolate it to nonsense, there are valid reasons for it. One, if a woman comes in for a job uh, and I don't know why I want you to feel more sorry for women than men, comes in for a job, or a man or a woman or a person comes in for a job in this time of trouble, you can't federally, under the Federal Human Rights Code, dealing with federal organizations, ask the age at all. After they're hired, you can say, show me a birth certificate, if necessary, to check an age for a legal commitment. I said to the girl in Ottawa this morning, do you mean to tell me if a little old man of 104 comes in and wants a job as a swamper, I can't say to him, I'm a federal employee, how old are you, Jimmy? She said, no, you can't. And I said, I wouldn't anyway, because he might say to me, I'm not 104, I'm only 33. It's just the lifestyle I've led that makes me look 104. The other thing you can't ask uh, is uh, military service. In case you also ask, what army did you serve in? And that would be a basis for perhaps potential discrimination for people with long memories. Similarly, you can't ask for a birth certificate because it might show uh, a national origin which could raise the problem of prejudice and bigotry. Oh, for a world filled with people with common sense and decency, which apparently is not the case as far as the Canadian Human Rights Code is concerned. Anyway, there's Mr. Fairweather's answer for him, the one he didn't know. Mind you, he's only got 10,000 employees and a budget of a billion dollars, but that's beside the point. Back to the problem of Headley, B.C., with a young, sincere young fella called Roy Trottier after the break. Young fellow called Ray Trottier with me now, who's been living for how long in Headley, BC? Uh, a little over two years. Two years. Now you've got a cause. You want to get some publicity for your cause. What's your cause? Uh, I would like to get, arrange for an emergency services program in Headley. As yet, we have nothing there. Now, Headley, as I recall, is halfway between Princeton and Academy. Yes. That's right. Just yep. about that. Do you That's have a doctor right. in the community? No doctor. Do you have an ambulance in the community? Uh, the nearest ambulance is half an hour to three quarters of an hour away. Now, so you so in any emergency, therefore, you're relying on the ambulance from Princeton, I presume. That's correct. Now, has this shortage of ambulance service or medical service caused any real bad problems lately in Headley? Well, I can tell you, uh, about two weeks ago, a young fellow had gotten into an accident, and. Uh, he died an hour after the accident. Was that the motorcycle accident? Yes, it was. In the middle of October? Yes, it was. And uh, you had to send for an ambulance from? 
an ambulance was called for from Princeton and what happened was a local person who knew first aid was called on the scene. Uh, there was nothing organized so what happened was uh, somebody else came along and said it's okay we've got help now and they cancelled the ambulance. Well, it was an honest uh, it was misunderstanding, an honest if misunderstanding. it happened at all, I presume. That's correct. But meanwhile, the young fellow who was involved in the motorcycle accident died. That's correct. So how long was it before the ambulance got there? Three quarters of an hour. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. Now, there was another incident a year before which you were telling somebody about. What was that one? A fellow had cut his arm with a chainsaw. It was a rather simple accident. Uh, it could have been handled by anybody that knew first aid. What happened was the lady didn't know of any first aid help. There was nothing around in town. So she drove her husband to the hospital in Princeton, or tried to. She got into an accident along the way and she died. She died? She died. Did he die? No, he's alive. He alive. But he, he I'll bet that him. for a while he was wishing that he did. Now, you don't have a hospital. Our uh, closest hospital again is in Princeton. You don't have a doctor? No doctor. You don't have a nurse? Uh, no nurse. You don't have a health clinic? Nothing. Do you have any first aid equipment? No. Uh, the only first aid equipment that we have is uh, just a little bit of stuff that I've paid for out of my own pocket, some bandages. It's not enough. We have nothing like an oxygen You've got nobody trained in first aid up there at all? None of the old... How many people are living in Headley? There are slightly less than 600 people. The mine is totally closed, I presume. Uh, it's, it will be opening in the future, uh, as soon as the economy can get straightened out. Well, that was a gold mine, wasn't yes, it? Yes, it gold was. Gold silver? It is. It's gold. The gold mine, Headley. A magnificent old building up the face of the mountain, as I recall. That's right. I was working up uh, by that old building for two years. Now... Have you been to the provincial government for any kind of help? You're not suggesting that there should be a full-time ambulance stationed in Headley because you wouldn't have the calls to justify anything like a full-time ambulance, would you? Uh, no, sir. We're not asking for an ambulance at all. What we're asking for is the equipment and the means to be able to have a first responders team, uh, people that would be able to get to a scene of an accident and keep the victim alive until the ambulance gets there. Have you there. spoken to the emergency services people of the BC Ministry of Health at all? I have spoken to the uh, to the local member of the uh, BC Ambulance Association, and uh, he has offered uh, free first aid classes. Training. Well, that's something, isn't it? Yes, it is. But you're looking for some money from Canada Community Development Project. Have you applied for it? Yes, I have. Is that an Ottawa federal project? It's an Ottawa federal project. How much money and, do you want uh, to get? Well, uh, any reasonable amount. Any reasonable amount to buy the equipment and to pay wages. You mean to buy? Oh, you, you want to make? You want to have a full-time first aid man? No, not exactly. Uh, first aid isn't the only program that we're wanting to set up. We have no fire department. Uh -huh. Well, good. not. We don't have a fire department that is reasonable. All we have are uh, two s small rickshaws that you go pulling the hoses out to wherever there's a fire. And uh, if there's that's, water. Well, there is water. Uh, the Headley Improvement District makes sure of that. But it's, it's, a, uh, it's, an anti it's a volunteer with no training, no anything. And our police force, well, we have a police officer come out and visit Headley every few days from Princeton. They do the best job that they can, but... Now, have you applied for this Canada Community Development Project? Yes, I have. You have? Oh. And have you been refused? No, I haven't. Uh, I was speaking with the newspaper and they misquoted me on it. Uh, what happened was they were trying to tell me no and uh, I had argued with them on the phone for a while and then they said fine. They They're going to consider it. They're considering it. That's and it. you would want to be employed in this. Do you think you're a suitable fellow for this development project? You willing to? Have you had any first aid? No. Yes, I've taken uh, <coughs> I've taken the workman's compensation first aid uh, course, and uh, I'm. You were running to... another project before. What was that? No, I wasn't running it. I was working for the One Way Adventure Foundation. One Way Adventure Foundation. Right, right. Here. How long have you lived up there, Ryan? I've lived up there for a little over two years. And what's your own trade as such? Well, I've been a cook and uh, child counselor or juvenile counselor Hello there. for the last two years. Yeah, you want to talk about this subject? 
Okay, here, I'll put you on there. Go ahead, please. I've only got a couple of minutes. Go ahead, please. Okay, may I suggest that he contact the Emergency Health Services Commission in Victoria. The number there is 387-1051. Right. Or a local number here at 872-8401. And uh, he could also get in contact with the Ambulance Employees Union. They may give some assistance at 438-8191. Yeah, there does seem to be some reason for a little bit of action when you've got 600 people or so living halfway between Princeton and Cadamias on a highway too, doesn't it? Yes, that's very true. What they may be able to do is help uh, set up a first aid post in that area. Give me uh, the union number again. The union number is 438-8191. That's the Ambulance Employees Union. AEU. Yes. Thanks very much. Do you know any place else where uh, such a kind of uh, simple facility has been set up? Uh, I can't say right offhand, but there are a number of them throughout the province in small okay. communities where it doesn't warrant an actual ambulance, they can set up a first aid post. The first number you gave me was emergency health services, the second one was? That's the, the second one was the Vancouver office on West Broadway at 8728401. Right, and the last one's the union. Yeah. Thanks very much for taking the trouble to call, very kind of you. You're welcome. Cheerio, all the best. Okay, Right. Well, I wish you well. Do uh, you think you can qualify for the grant properly and you have to rent accommodation? And we have to rent the accommodations. Uh, I believe that we have met all the qualifications. It's got to be a kind of informal thing though, otherwise you'll get into unionization and BC government employees union and federal government problems. But I would agree with you on the face of it that something's got to be done to have some kind of first aid post, hopefully staffed, and dear old Headley. I don't care whether I get a job out of it, and I don't care uh, how the thing is funded. It's just that I'm tired of seeing a lot of old folks that have worked their lives and retired in Headland, and Headley, nobody no cares about them. Thanks very much for coming in this morning, Mr. Trottier. I'll be back after the break. I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. Bill van der Zand on tomorrow. Away we go again. Good old Willie. What else? Don't know. It'll be something. I don't know. We're always bright and Webster at 9 a.m. precisely. Transit cutbacks on check with Webster at midnight. Wild Willie Van Der Zyme on Webster at 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs> <laughs> 